Thank you very much for coming to the analysis seminar. It's a great pleasure to introduce Michael Roizen from uh, Tel Aviv, uh, Kent, and Missouri, I guess. Uh, <laughs> he will speak on measure theoretic projection bodies. Uh, Michael. Sure. So thank you for the opportunity to give a talk. And uh, thank you to Elena for the invitation. So yeah, the talk will be on uh, measure theoretic extensions of projection bodies. And to make the story complete, uh, I'll talk about two joint one, two joint works, one with uh, David Alonso Gutierrez, Maria Hernandez Cipri, Jesus Yepes, Nicholas uh, Artem Zavavich, and a second work with uh, Dylan Langhurst and Artem Zavavich. So uh, I'd like to start with a with a short background of uh, convex geometry. So I'll always call a subset K of of R n a convex body. If it is compact, convex, and always has non-empty interior, it's some some people take one point sets, but for the talk, we'll always assume that the interior has has a bit inside. And uh, just for shorthand, I'll denote the set of all convex bodies in our end by script k to the m. And with convex bodies, we we equip this with some notion of addition. We often call it the Minkowski addition or the Minkowski sum, but what it means is that for any two convex bodies, K and L, you take all vectoral combinations of points in K and points in L and just the set of all of these. And relevant to the talk is this other representation. You can fix the body K, reflect the body L about the origin, and then shift minus L so that whenever it intersects K at, at non-empty points, this is uh, the Minkowski sum. And just for a picture, if I take a square A plus a circle B, its Minkowski sum is just the, the extended neighborhood of A. And so uh, you, you go out by the radius. And you can do it with a triangle. You can do it with a square and a triangle, any, any convex objects. And in fact, the Minkowski sum remains convex. This is one of the, the key points of considering this addition. Um, and then to connect convex geometry to analysis, uh, the, the first thing that one considers is maybe how some linear functional might act. So we consider the, the volume, it, just the volume in the usual sense, the, the Lebesgue integral, the characteristic function of your set. And so if you take any two convex bodies, K and L, uh, the volume of their Minkowski sum to the one over N power always exceeds the sum of their volumes, each raised to the one over N power. And there's a quality if and only if L is homothetic to K. In other words, you can scale K by a positive way and shift it and obtain L from this. Uh, moreover, if you use the homogeneity of the volume, you can, you can take one minus T here uh, and T on L. So this is just the set of all uh, T times X such that uh, T times X such that X belongs to L. So the, the standard dilation. And the Brumankowski inequality, in fact, asserts that the volume is one over n concave with respect to the Minkowski sum. And just uh, as an equivalent form, if you use this uh, famous inequality of arithmetic geometric mean and the homogeneity of the volume, then the Brumankowski inequality uh, not only implies, but is equivalent to the weaker inequality with the geometric average. So it says that the volume of the convex co Minkowski combination of K with L always exceeds the, the geometric uh, average of the volume of K and the volume of L. Okay, in other words, if you if you apply a logarithm, volume is logarithmically concave with respect to Minkowski sum. Okay, so- Michael, uh, please. Uh, very silly question. Uh, yeah, can please. you do something similar in hyperbolic space, like define an analog of uh, Minkowski sum? Uh, maybe choose an origin or something like that. And... It, it might be possible, but it's not something I've considered. So um, I don't know. I, I don't work in uh, hyperbolic geometry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's just a, kind of an idle, idle thing. Because, but, but yeah, yeah I, I, I mean, uh, maybe if you just think in the upper half point, you can maybe do something with uh, with radial functions of convex bodies and maybe define it this way. Something okay. like that. Thanks. Maybe. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Way back in the 1800s, Minkowski considered uh, a notion of surface area of a convex body. So by uh, partial K, I, I mean the boundary of your convex body K, 
And so the surface area, the m minus one dimensional volume of the boundary of K is just defined to be the difference quotient of K plus epsilon the Euclidean ball, take volume minus volume of K, all divided by epsilon. And here the, the Euclidean ball B2N is just a set of all X and Rn so that the Euclidean norm of X never exceeds one. And we denote its, its uh, surface by S to the M minus one, just the, the usual unit sphere. And if one applies the broom minkowski inequality to this difference quotient, you obtain the following isoparametric type inequality, which we often refer to as the Minkowski inequality. It asserts that the surface area of the boundary of any convex body always exceeds n times the volume of the convex body to the m minus one over n power times the volume of the Euclidean ball to the one over n. And then you use the fact that you can relate the volume of the Euclidean ball to the volume of its boundaries. You, so the, the surface area, uh, the volume of the surface area of the Euclidean ball is just n times its volume. You plug it in here. And so you obtain the isoparametric inequality, which asserts that we'll say that the volume ratio of the, the, bound, the boundary of K over the boundary of the Euclidean ball to the one over N always exceeds the volume ratio of the volume of K and the volume of the Euclidean ball. So this is very, very nice. But uh, in fact, Roman-Minkowski inequality holds for even, even larger classes of measure, not, not just the volume. So in fact, uh, we can discuss this notion of Roman-Minkowski for beta concave measures. Uh, and so what one does is they fix some parameter S and minus one over the dimension of plus infinity and some T and zero one. And if you have any measure mu on Rn with non-negative density so that when you raise it to the S power, it is concave on its support. Then for any pair of Borel measurable sets, you have that mu of the convex Minkowski combination of these sets always exceeds the beta average of the measure of the first set A and the measure of the first set of uh, the second set B. And here beta, it, it depends both on the dimension and the, the concavity parameter that you pick to begin with. Uh, and Convex bodies are certainly Borel measurable sets. They're compact. So if you if you want to say uh, a measure is beta concave on the class of convex bodies, if mu of the of the Minkowski convex combination of them always exceeds the beta combination of the measures of each of the sets. And just as a very important example, away from the volume, one can consider the standard uh, Gaussian probability density, which is the measure whose density is given by one over two pi to the n over two, e to the minus uh, Euclidean norm squared divided by two. And in fact, it satisfies sort of the geometric room Minkowski inequality, meaning that the, the Gaussian measure of any convex Minkowski combination of any pair of Borel sets always exceeds the Gaussian measure of the first set to the one minus t times the Gaussian measure of the second set to the t. In other words, the Gaussian measure is logarithmically concave when you take uh, Borel measurable sets. And uh, one way to do this is to use this uh, celebrated Procopa Leinler inequality. I won't comment on this in the talk too much, uh, but it is a functional form of, of the Brumankowski inequality that we, we mentioned before. Or if you wanna do it directly, you can really prove this by induction on the dimension. You can prove it in dimension one and then push yourself forward from there. Okay, so we have we have two examples. We have volume, which is one over n concave on the class of convex bodies, and the Gaussian measure, which is logarithmically concave on the class of convex bodies. So it's uh, with Brumankowski. In fact, Rogers and Shepard asked, "What about reversing Brumankowski?" So if I go back to Brumankowski, it says that volume of k plus l to the one over n is bigger than the volume of k to the one over n. Volume of l to the one over n. If I replace L by minus K, I can reflect K about the origin. Then this says that the, the volume of the difference at K plus minus K to the one over N is always bigger than the volume of K to the one over N plus the volume of minus K to the one over N, but uh, volume is even. So this just says that the volume of the difference at K plus negative K to the one over N is bigger than or equal than the volume, than twice the volume of K to the one over N. And is this form of Brumankowski that actually exhibits a reverse form. 
and uh, this is very nice. It's called the, the Roger Shepard inequality, and it asserts the following. For any convex body K, and you really, for this, convexity is very important. The volume of the difference body, that's K plus negative K, never exceeds two n choose n volume of K. And let me make a comment that uh, the different set is not always just the, the origin, right? If K is uh, an origin symmetric convex set, say the Euclidean ball, if I take K plus negative K, you blow it up by twice. So it, it becomes uh, the Euclidean ball of radius two. Uh, so here, the volume of the difference body of K and minus K never exceeds two n choose n, the volume of K. And in fact, there's a quality here only when K is the n-dimensional simplex. So you, it, it really is a way to characterize the simplex in terms of the volume of a convex body which is very, very nice. If you go on this side, we, we said the volume of the difference at K is greater than or equal to two to the N volume of K. But there's a quality here, if and only if K is origin symmetric, you go back to what we talked about before it, and it means K has to be homothetic to minus K. This exactly means that K is an origin symmetric convex body. So on the lower end from Brumankowski for this very specific body, you have equality for origin symmetric. And on this side, the Roger Shepard, you have equality for an n-dimensional simplex, which in the language of convex bodies is about as far away from being origin symmetric as one can get, which is very nice. So what, what this really says is that for any origin symmetric, for any convex body K, you can find one, this K minus K, which is origin symmetric, so that the volume ratio between the two is very, very close. It's either bigger than or equal than one or smaller than or equal to say four to the N. You just, asymptotically approximate this guy by, by four to the end and it'll, it'll work out. Okay, and then Rolf Schneider in 1970s proved a, a very sort of beefed up version of this inequality. So what he did was he took any convex body K, took some parameter P and the natural numbers and defined this, this P difference by this DPK to be the set of all P tuples of vectors in R and P. So the K intersected with K plus X1, intersected with K plus X2, intersected with K plus XP is not equal to the empty set. And he showed that the N P dimensional volume of this P difference body never exceeds M P plus N choose N, the volume of K to the P power. And this, as it turns out, also classifies the N dimensional simplex. He showed that equality is attained if and only if K is, is a simplex. So we have Brumankowski for volume, we have Brumankowski for Gaussian measure, and for this whole class of beta concave measures, if, if one can find one which exhibits these. So it's, it seems to be fair to ask if you have a non-negative Borel measure mu and Rn, can one expect a Roger Shepard type inequality? Meaning that the measure of the difference body never exceeds some constant depending on the dimension. Here I wrote two and choose M, but say some constant depending on the dimension, the measure of K. And unfortunately this question is, is not the best to ask because you can just take the Gaussian that we considered before. You take the one-dimensional Gaussian and you have this measure which is decreasing. And in dimension one, all convex bodies with our definition are just symmetric intervals. And what, what you can do is you can shift K very, very far away from the origin, as far away as you want. Well, K minus K is always a convex body at the origin, it doesn't move. So it's of some fixed positive Gaussian measure where this one can be made as small as I want. Right, and I can make it so that whenever I multiply by any dimensional constant, it's smaller than this mu of the difference body. And so the, the question needs to be changed a bit. We have to take into consideration where the convex body K is. And, and this is actually what we were able to do with, uh, with David, Maria, Jesus, and Artem. So we took a measure mu on our N, whose density is radially decreasing, meaning whenever I look in one dimension, it's a decreasing function. So then for any convex body K1 has the following, the, the measure of the difference body of K never exceeds two N choose N. So the same constant as the, the original Roger Shepard inequality. And then this translated average measure, you, you average the, the, me, the measures of the shifts of K by minus Y over all Y and K, and then uh, divide by the volume. So if mu is the Lebesgue measure, this doesn't see the shift. You use Fubini theorem. This is just volume of K times mu of times volume of K divided by volume of K. It's just volume of K. And in fact, if B is continuous at the origin, then there's a quality here, if and only if. 
Uh, the measure mu is a positive multiple of the Lebesgue measure on the difference body of K, and K itself is an n-dimensional simplex. So we recover the original Roger Shepard inequality, which is very nice. So now we have uh, Romankowski on one side uh, for, say, Gaussian measure, and now we have Roger Shepard on the other side for Gaussian measure. So you have this now Gaussian volume ratio estimate that's, that we had considered before, which is, which is nice. Okay, and I'd like to make a, a point that the radially decreasing assumption cannot be removed. And, and you can just see from this picture, if I take the Euclidean ball in two dimensions from the comment I made before, when you take a different body, it blows up to the Euclidean ball of radius two. And what I can do is I can take the measure whose density is one on a very, very small annulus around the boundary and one on this small ball here. So that no matter how many times I try to peck the boundary with six copies of the original body K, I will never touch this ball, right? So I can pick the largest one, whatever it is, and I can adjust epsilon and delta to where it needs to work. And I'll always have the mu of the difference body of the two-dimensional Euclidean ball is always bigger than six times the largest of these, of these shifts. And certainly in this case, it's larger than this average. Or you just replace this with supremum again and then cancel out the volumes. So the radially decreasing assumption is, is necessary in our theorem. And then I, I just like to make a comment that I was actually able to prove a version of Schneider's result uh, in this setting. So I, I can take a measure nu that exhibits some concavity as one over S concave for some positive parameter S and such that its uh, maximum is at the origin. I can take any, P, any I from one to P, I measure mu I, which is radially decreasing, as a density, which is radially decreasing. And then I can take the product measure of all of these mu I's from one to P. And I can take various subspaces, M I dimensional in the I, M I copy of R N. And then I take H bar to be their product, the Cartesian product. Then in fact, you, you get the same thing. You get that the new measure of this P difference body of K intersected with this H bar and never exceeds some constant now, depending on the dimension, this subdimension, this M, which is just the, the sum of all of these guys, divided by eight of K and then an integral over K and the product of the mu I measures of this of the affine section of H I and Y minus K. Okay, and again, if you pick uh, P equals one, you get the result that I had before with uh, Artem, Maria, Jesus, and David. And if you take volume, you recover Roger Shepard, which is, which is nice. Okay, so to a convex body, we can actually associate a function called the support function. For any convex body, a support function is just the distance from uh, the distance in a direction from the origin to the supporting hyperplane of K in this given direction. And, and from this is certainly a convex function just from the triangle inequality and the inner product, it's homogeneous of degree one. And in fact, you can, in this way, understand the Minkowski sum as the convex body whose radial function in every direction is the sum of the support functions of K and L in each of these directions. Okay. And with the support function, we can define what is called the projection body and the covariogram. So for any convex body, it's projection body, which we denote capital uh, PK, is the convex body whose support function in every direction theta is the volume of the body projected onto the orthogonal complement of, uh, of that direction. So let me see if I can, if I can just draw it real quick to, to make, it, make it nicer. If I have a convex body K, I have a direction theta, and this guy is theta perp. You project k onto here. You take this volume and you say that's the support function in that direction. You can do it here. Again, project. And you do this in every direction. And this is how you obtain the projection body. What is not clear a priori is the fact that by doing this, you get a support function, right? It's not clear that the M minus one dimensional volume of an orthogonal projection of a convex body onto a hyperplane is convex, but in fact it is. And, and we understand it through the covariogram, 
what we do is we, and this is in hand why we considered uh, the alternative definition of the Minkowski sum. So the kvarigram of a convex body G sub K of X is the volume of K intersected with this translates. So you, you take K, you shift it, and you take the volume of the intersection. In fact, if you use Fubini's theorem, you can see that this is the, the convolution of the characteristic function of K with the characteristic function of the reflection of K. And then from here, what Metherium was able to prove in the 1970s is that the radial derivatives of this Kvarigram function are connected to the, to the projection body. He showed that the radial derivative of the Kvarigram at r equals zero is minus one half the integral over the boundary of k, the absolute value of the scalar product of the direction with the outer unit normal of the convex body at y is equal to minus this volume of the orthogonal projection of k onto the hyperplane orthogonal to that direction. But this is defined to be minus the support function of pi k. So if I remove all of the minuses, now you really have a, a convex function that is homogeneous of degree one. This is a support function. And in this way, you can see this guy defines a support function of a convex body. And so what, uh, why, why would one consider such objects? And one way to motivate it is this, uh, the Shepard's problem, which was solved by Petty and Schneider in the 1970s. The Shepard problem asserts the following thing. If I have two origin symmetric convex bodies, K and L, and I have some information about their orthogonal projections onto, onto the same hyperplane. I have that the volume of the orthogonal projection of K is always smaller than the volume of the orthogonal projection of L onto that same hyperplane in every direction. Is it true that the volume of K never exceeds the volume of L? In other words, if the support function of the projection body of K in the direction theta is always smaller than the volume of the projection body uh, of the support function of the projection body of L in the direction theta, must the volume of K be smaller than the volume of L? And the answer is yes, if the dimension is smaller than or equal than two, and no, the answer is bigger than or equal than three. It's true in dimension two, because every origin symmetric convex body in dimension two is in fact a projection body. And it's negative in dimension three and above. Uh, Petty and Schneider demonstrated counterexamples to this. And in fact, one one can check it was it was proven uh, that this is always true. The conclusion is always true when the smaller body is a projection body, which is which is nice. So there there is an affirmative for certain class of convex bodies. And also connected to the projection body is this this question of Petty which asks whether ellipsoids minimize the, this following affine invariant. This volume of k to the one minus n times the volume of the projection body over all origin symmetric convex bodies in dimension n greater than or equal than three. The answer is no in dimension two, exactly because of the comment I told you before. The fact that all origin symmetric convex bodies in dimension two are projection bodies. Okay. Uh, this question, it's hard. I mean, it's very, very hard. And it's uh, one way to understand this is the fact that if one tries to do Steiner symmetrization, the standard symmetrization that we consider in convex geometry, uh, this is not preserved. In fact, it, it moves in different ways. This was shown by Christo Sauerglue. And so uh, the standard technique that one uses to prove these sort of uh, affine, affine isoparametric inequalities, standard symmetrization, doesn't work here. So one needs to try to tackle this problem in a different way. Uh, okay, so, sure. There's a deep history to this problem. I mean, a very, very deep history that spans, of course, more than 50 years. And I can't talk about it all now, but there are beautiful books by Rolf Schneider called uh, Convex Geometry, the broom Minkowski Theory, and by Richard Gardner called Geometric Tomography that really detail the history of projection bodies and of these conjectures. But I, let me make a few key points. Schneider showed a class reduction. He showed that if one knows this thing called the Boseman-Petty centroid inequality with its equality conditions for polar zonoids, 
then one can deduce Petty's conjectured inequality with its associated equality conditions. Uh, Erwin Wutvak in the 1980s uh, published many works concerning Petty's conjecture. And actually very, very recently in 2017, finally some progress was made on Petty's conjecture. It was shown to hold true in a, in a very smooth neighborhood of the Euclidean ball by Christo Sauerglue and Artem Zavavich. And it's based on what their argument is based on a work of, of Alexander Fish, Fedor Nazarov, and Di Maria Bogan, where they considered fixed points of this intersection body operator. I won't comment on what intersection body operator is, but is more or less dual to the projection body operator. More progress also appeared uh, soon after by Muhammad Aviki, and even more recently this year by Oscar Ortega Marino and Franz Schuster concerning fixed points of, of Minkowski evaluation. Okay. Uh, while its conjecture is open, he was able in 1970 to prove an inequality concerning the polar of the projection body of K. So what Petty was able to show, he instead considered the, the affine invariant quantity volume of K to, to M minus one power times the volume of the polar projection body of K, meaning he, he took dual. Here, L, L circle, is just all X and R, and so that the support function of X never exceeds one. For for example, if you just take uh, LP balls for P bigger than one, it's polar is the LQ ball, where Q is holder conjugate to P. So this is one such example. And he, he showed a very, very strong affine isoparametric inequality called the petty projection inequality. He showed that for any convex body K, uh, the volume of K to M minus one, times the volume of the polar projection body of K never exceeds the volume ratio of the volume of the Euclidean ball in N dimensions times the volume of the M minus one dimensional Euclidean ball to dimension N. And there's a quality if and only if K is an ellipsoid. And in fact, uh, in the 1990s, Gao Yong Zhang showed that Petty's projection inequality not only implies, but is in fact equivalent to an affine version of, of the celebrated Sobolev inequality. So this is nice. We we have a affine isoparametric inequality, but why is it called affine isoparametric? One can use uh, Petty's inequality to prove the classical isoparametric inequality that we considered before. And this is kind of where the word uh, isoparametric comes from. You can consider a certain functional. At some moment, you apply this inequality and you get the, the standard isoparametric inequality, which is very, very nice. And in fact, even before Zhang showed that Petty's projection inequality is equivalent to a, an affine version of the Sobolev inequality, he was able to prove a reverse form of the projection inequality, which is called Zhang's inequality. So for any convex body K, if you consider the same product, the volume of K to the M minus one, since the volume of the polar projection body, it always exceeds two n choose n divided by n to the n, and there's a quality if and only if k is a simplex. So again, we have a range. We have uh, an upper bound where you have a quality for things which are very, very origin symmetric, uh, ellipsoids, and a lower bound for objects which are about as far away from being origin symmetric as one can be, and dimensional simplices. So, so this is very nice. And in fact, even more is true. Richard Gardner and, and Zhang in the 1990s showed that there is an entire family of convex bodies called the, P, called the P radial mean bodies, which connect this difference body, this K plus minus K to the polar projection body of K. And as a consequence, one is able to understand the Roger Shepard inequality and Zhang's projection inequality as two extremes of a family of volumetric inequalities. And the result is the following. For any convex body K and any parameters P and Q that always exceed negative one, you can find convex bodies associated to K, R, P, K, and R, Q, K called the P and Q radial mean bodies, such that the following happens. The volume of the difference body never exceeds some constant depending on the dimension and on P, the volume of the P radial mean body of K, and this never exceeds some constant depending on N and Q, the volume of the Q radial mean body of K, and this never exceeds N to the N volume of K to the N, the volume of the polar projection body of K. And in every single one of these inequalities, there's a quality if and only if K is a simplex. You have a family of volumetric inequalities which classify the simplex. 
and here the constants depend on on the beta function of uh, r and n. And in fact, they showed something very very nice. They showed that when you pick p equal to q equal to n, the volume of the n radial mean body of k is in fact equal to the volume of k. And so here you get volume of k minus k is less than or equal to. This becomes two n choose n, and this becomes volume of k. So here you really get Roger Shepard. Here, if you absorb, if you again replace this guy, you get two n choose n. Here you get volume of k, and here you get volume of k to the n. You move volume of k over, you move n to the n over, you have two n choose n over n to the n, volume of k to the n minus one, volume of the poor projection body of k, and you get Zhang's inequality, which is which is very, very nice. And in fact, they even showed a, a relatively nice inclusion just between the difference body of k and the polar projection body of k. They showed that the polar projection body of any convex body, when scaled by n times the volume of the body, this is always this always contains the difference body of k. And one can use this inclusion together with some integrating and polar coordinates, in fact, to prove that Zhang's inequality holds for a general measure. So you can take a measure mu, which is absolutely continuous with respect to the Lebesgue measure and non-negative and a convex body k. Then one has that this average of the gram of k with respect to the measure mu divided by the volume of k never exceeds mu and volume of k times the polar projection body of k. And this inequality is asymptotically sharp, meaning I can find an example of a measure and an example of a body where this is equality. The unfortunate thing about this is that if I take volume here, and I take volume here, I use Fubini theorem. Here I get vo volume of K, I get volume of K to the N, I get N to the N, I get volume of the forward projection body of K, but I'm missing a two N choose N here. I'm in fact not recovering Zhang's inequality from this. So what Artem Dillon and I sought to do was the CF1 by imposing restrictions on the, on the density of the measure, if you can get something sharper here, if you can get a, a better constant. So first, and, and finally to the point of the talk, we were able to discuss this notion of a measured theoretic projection body. So we take a measure mu on Rn, which has a non-negative density and a convex body K, then the mu covariogram of K is defined to be, G sub mu K is just mu of K, the mu measure of K intersected with this translates. And this is just the integral over k intersect x plus k phi of y dy. And the, the, the key point is, OK, we have a covariogram. Can one get a convex body from this? We showed before that if you have the standard covariogram, you take its radial derivatives in every direction, you get uh, minus the support function of the projection body of k. And so we, we tried to do the same thing. We asked that for any convex body k and any any reasonable measure, we took a measure which is Lipschitz in some neighborhood of k, who, whose uh, density is Lipschitz in some neighborhood of k. Then you get an expression for the radial derivatives of the mu covariogram. We showed that the radial derivative of the mu covariogram at r equals zero is minus one half the integral over the boundary of k, the absolute value of the scalar product of the direction with the outer unit normal of k at y times the density dy plus some inner product of a vector with the direction. And this vector is one half the integral over k, the gradient of phi dy. So if I pick volume again, this is identically equal to one. And this becomes zero because this is zero. And you get the radial derivative of the Metherian proof for the standard covariogram. If I pick k to be centered, let's say I pick phi to be the Gaussian, Again, this is zero, and you, you get some expression here in terms of the Gaussian measure on the boundary of K. And with this, we, it made sense for us to define the, the mu projection body of K. So what we do is we take some measure mu with the density phi non-negative, and we define its polar projection body P sub mu K as a convex body whose support function in every direction is given by one half the integral over the boundary of K the absolute value of the scalar product of the direction with the outer unit normal vector at y, v of y dy. So we have now a notion of measure theoretic projection body. And in fact, using some polar coordinate arguments, we even showed an inclusion similar 
to that of Zhang and, and Gardner. So we, we can take a, a strictly non-negative increasing convertible function and a measure of mu which exhibits concavity with respect to this function, meaning, uh, meaning that f of mu of the Minkowski combination always exceeds the, the, con the convex f combination of the measures of the sets. And we give it some density feed. Then for any convex body k whose mu measure is greater than zero, and such that the gradient over the guy is equal to zero, the one has a, the difference body of k is contained in f of mu of k divided by f prime of mu of k times the volume times the polar projection body of pi of mu of k. So again, if you pick volume, pick f to be t to the one over n, then this exactly recovers the gardner zhang inclusion that we discussed before. And just as an example, if I take polar and I take a simplex and I take the Gaussian measure, just the usual Gaussian measure, here's an example of what its polar projection body should be. So actually, it, it is something which is origin symmetric, even in the case when the original body is not symmetric. So this, this is nice. OK, well, let me just talk about a general inequality. If you have a measure nu, which is radially non-decreasing as a continuous density fee, and you have some function, some non-negative function that is concave, compactly supported, zero lies in the interior of its support, and it attains its maximum at zero, and you have some function q from the non-negative rails to r that is increasing, then uh, you can get an inequality of the integral of the composition of f with q, integrate over the support of f against the measure nu in terms of some polar integral, some beta constant integral over the sphere, integral from zero to some z theta, v of r theta, r to the m minus one dr d theta, where here z of theta is minus the radial derivative of f at zero to the minus one times f of zero. And then beta is some constant, which depends on the dimension, q and f. And you have a quality, it can be checked if and only if uh, phi is a constant. And then what one does is one combines this result together with this result on the, on the radial derivatives of the mu covariogram to establish Young's inequality for two measures. So for any convex body K, any two measures mu and nu, where the density of mu is Lipschitz in some neighborhood of the convex body K, and nu is radially non-decreasing. So you have this measure, which is increasing in different directions. And you have some function from the non-negative reals to the non-negative reals as increasing convertible and differentiable. And such that f composed with the mu covariogram of k is concave, then in fact, you have the Jean type inequality, one over mu of k, the integral over k, the new measure of y minus k against the measure mu never exceeds n divided by mu of k, where mu of k is something strictly positive, times the new measure of this guy from the inclusion that we talked about, this f of mu of k divided by f prime of mu of k, the polar of pi of mu of k minus the vector that we considered before, and then times some constant depending on f mu of k in the dimension. So if one picks something nice, say we pick some s bigger than zero, uh, measure with a radially non-decreasing density and mu being s concave, then for any convex body k, one has that the constant becomes n plus s to the minus one choose n divided by mu of k, integral over k, nu of y minus k d mu never exceeds. <laughs> yeah. Enormous. Yeah, it's, it's enormous. Nu of s to the minus one mu of k and then this polar body. But uh, let, let me just make this kind of nice if one can attempt. If I pick s as one over n and all of these things are volume, this becomes two n choose n. This is volume of k, 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 you can bring it out. This is n, you can bring it out, n to the n. This guy goes away. This becomes the usual polar body of k. And you really get that two n choose n divided by n to the n is smaller than or equal to the volume of the polar projection body of k times the volume of k to the n minus one. And you recover Zhang's inequality. So, so this works out reasonably. <laughs> as painful as it is to say, we do get Zhang's inequality back. And we even get Zhang type inequalities for these new objects that haven't been considered before, these, these mu projection bodies. 
Uh, how am I doing on time? There's still some time. Okay. And just one more comment. I mean, we also extended it to the to the functional setting. So we we take a convex body K, we take a, a measure with an non-negative density, and you take a locally integrable function, F, a non-negative locally integrable function. You can define the mu covariogram of F on the body K if F is supported on K is the integral over k intersect x plus k f of y minus x v of y dy. And then in fact, we showed that you get a similar formula for the radial derivatives. You have that the derivative of the mu f covariogram at, of the body k is one half integral over k f gradient of phi minus phi gradient of f inner product with theta dy minus this guy, which looks like our support function, this minus one half integral over the boundary of k the absolute value of the scalar product of theta with the outer unit normal of k at y, f of y, and then d mu of y. And I think that's everything that I wanted to cover, but if there's enough time, I'd like to present a proof of this result that I have with, with Artem and Dylan, that the radial derivative at zero in fact has this representation. So do, do I have enough time to do this? Yeah, you have about 15 minutes. Okay. So are there any questions before I before I go to the proof about about what I've talked about? It's okay. So let's go to the proof. So what we hope to prove is the following that for any convex body K, a measure mu on R n, which has a Lipschitz density in some neighborhood of K. Then for every direction, you have that the partial derivative of the mu covariogram, maybe I should write it down correctly, is in fact equal to this representation that we that we said before. So I'll, I'll just try my best to give a sketch of the proof. And I uh, apologize for my, my poor handwriting. I, I, I am sorry about that. But here's here's the idea. You just use the standard notion of derivative. You take d d r g mu k of r theta. So I'm writing x and r n as r theta at r equals zero, and you you just write it. It is the limit as epsilon goes to zero from the right, as r goes to zero from the right. Let's say because r is a radius. You can pick a direction. You can reflect if you wish. So I'm just going to pick a side r from the right. Send r to zero from the right, and you do one over r, and then you write your integrals. It is the integral over k, the characteristic function of your convex body at y minus r theta, v of y, and then minus the guy at the other end, integral over k, v of y. And so what's the idea? You're exactly measuring that this is k, and this is unfortunately drawn uh, r theta plus k. We're trying to measure this guy, right? And we're trying to send things to zero. So what exactly are we doing? I'm going to add and subtract zero and just write this as the limit. r goes to zero from the right, one over r. And then, yes, and then the following integral. I'll change the first term. I'll apply a change of variables, y plus r theta rather than y minus r theta. And this will be integral over k intersect k minus r theta, v of y plus r theta. And then I'm going to subtract a, a middle term, integral over k, v of y plus r theta. So here I'm not moving k. I'm going to do the same thing, integral over k, v of y plus r theta. And then I'm going to subtract the last one, integral over k, v of y. OK, so what can I do to this guy? I can consider the second pair of terms. I can use the fact that phi is Lipschitz in one dimension, which means that on k, under the assumptions, is differentiable. It's, it's very, very nice, at least differentiable enough. And I can use the dominated convergence theorem, and I can just say, well, this goes where I want it to go. So using this assumption, you have the first term, this limit, 
r goes to zero from the right, one over r, this integral over k intersected with k minus r theta, p of y plus r theta, minus this other term integral over k, p of y plus r theta, and then plus some guy. And it turns out that the guy is this integral over k, radiant of phi with theta dy. So we sort of have our other term, at least twice it, and we would like to try to try to deal with this. And, and this is where most of the fight goes. But let me rewrite this guy slightly. I'll apply a change of variables again. I'll move some terms around. But in fact, this is the integral over k, scalar product of the gradient in the direction, and then plus, or right minus, limit as r goes to zero from the right, one over r, and then integral over all pieces of k shifted without k, v of y dy. So I, I'm trying to save some time by not writing out all the steps, but this is the main creature we need to fight with. If we show that this goes to the integral over the boundary of k of the scalar product that we want, then we're done. And here's here's the key claim. And this is this is where most of the fighting goes. I'll call it claim star. Most of the fighting involves showing that the limit as r goes to zero from the right of one over r integral over this k plus r theta minus k v of y is in fact equal to some integral over a set k theta. I'll call it this absolute value of the scalar product of the outer unit normal of k at y with theta, v of y, dy. And here k theta is this kind of goofy looking set. It's the set of all, let's say, s in the boundary of k. So that's the scalar product of, of the outer unit normal of k at s with the direction is always greater than or equal than zero. So this is the guy that we'll fight with. Okay, but uh, how does one do this? Unfortunately, I mean, if you just draw the picture, if you take K, here's K plus R theta, let's say. Let's say here's K. If you move the body in, in the direction, you can see that at most, you'll only catch half of the boundary. You won't catch the whole thing. Or if you simply evaluate this guy at zero, you catch the whole thing. So there's there's some nonsense here that, that one needs to do. You can't just use continuity. You really have to use some sort of squeeze theorem type argument. And so what we do is the following. We consider two, two set inclusions. The first one is we consider, I'll call it inclusion one, which is where most of the work goes. We consider all y plus t theta such that y is taken from the boundary of k. And the outer unit normal of k in a product with y at theta is greater than or equal to zero. And here you're taking t from zero to r, right? You're taking it as you know these little pieces in between. And this guy can be shown. I won't do it because it's, it's really a lot of energy. It can be shown to contain k plus r theta without k. That's the first guy. The second guy is to show that the set of all y plus t theta such that y is in the boundary of k, but now intersected with k plus r theta. So you take only those pieces where you have an intersection. Zero less than t, less than or equal to r. This guy is in fact inside of k plus r theta minus k. So going in the picture, the second guy is just, just this one, right? Just, just these little pieces here. With these two inclusions at in hand, and I mean, it's, it's quite a bit of work to show the first one. The second one, you can use a convexity argument. But with them in hand, you get two inequalities. So from, from two, you get some integral i, two of r theta never exceeds some integral over k plus r theta minus k. So from this guy, v of y dy. 
and this never exceeds some integral i1 of r theta. So this is from inclusion one, this is from inclusion two, and then from monotonicity. And so the idea is to, to squeeze, show that these two guys, in fact, go to the same thing, and then the, the result will follow. But here, what is I1 and I2? I1 of R theta is this integral over K theta, and then integral from zero to R. And the absolute value of the scalar product in K of Y with theta, T of Y plus T theta, dt dy. And the second guy, is just the the polar representation of the second one. R theta integral over the boundary of k intersected with k plus r theta integral from zero to r. Absolute value of the scalar product of the outer unit normal k at y with theta, and then phi of y plus t theta. Dt dy. Okay. And so so what do we do? We want to average this over r, send r to zero. We want to average this over r, send r to zero. So if I do the first one, it, it's really it's really not too terrible. So if I do the limit, r goes to zero from the right, one over r i two of r theta. So what do you do? I mean, the key point is that this guy is a beast which is compact. This guy is independent of r. And this guy is Lipschitz. You can use the Lebesgue differentiation theorem. And so if you use the Lipschitz condition together with the one-dimensional Lebesgue differentiation theorem, you see that this is integral over k of theta. The absolute value of the scalar product of uh, the absolute value of the scalar product of the outer unit normal of k at y with the direction theta, b of y dy. So the first one is a combination of using the Lipschitz condition, compactness and Lebesgue differentiation theorem. So this is I2. I2? No, I1. I1, I'm sorry. This is I1. I2 is where quite a bit more work goes. We need to split the integral and write it in terms of I1, in fact. So you can write I2 of R theta as I1 of R theta minus some other piece, this integral over K of theta minus k plus r theta. And then you integral from zero to r, the scalar product that we always consider, d of y plus t theta dt dy. Okay. And I'll call this some i1 of r theta minus i3 of r theta. And so what can we what can we do? I1 we've already handled. We know how to deal with it. What we need to show is that when r goes to zero and I average i3, this is in fact equal to zero. This is the last byte that we have. And then once we do this, we're done. Okay, but uh, how do we do this? You can use the fact, again, that phi is Lipschitz. And the fact that this is always smaller than or equal to one by Cauchy Schwartz. So you have that the absolute value of one over R for any small enough R, I three of R theta never exceeds the Lipschitz constant of phi times, and now this volume M minus one dimensions of K theta minus K plus R theta. Okay, but this guy is the last piece that we need to deal with. We need to show that this goes to zero with R. And in fact, it does. One just has to ver verify the following claim. I won't do it. Sorry, excuse my, my handwriting, but because of lack of time, I won't, I won't do it. We claim two. You show that the boundary of K intersected with K plus R theta converges as r goes to zero exactly to k theta. So this is what one does. And then here, this will claim two will in fact force the second term to go to zero. Uh, so yeah, th this is what you show with respect to inclusion monotonically with r, these guys converge to this guy. 
And then this exactly implies that the volume of k theta minus k plus r theta and minus one dimensions goes to zero. And so what does this do? You, you have two things here, which go to the same guy. Everything is non-negative. Everything is very nice. So if you put everything together, we've shown that the partial derivative of the mu covariogram of k at r equals zero is in fact equal to. Now this guy, this uh, integral over k in a product of gradient of phi with the direction, now minus integral over k theta, the absolute value of the scale of product of nk of y with theta v of y dy. And the last thing to do is to rearrange this piece. You, you play a game with this piece, you split it, you write it. And once you do that, you can, this in fact tells you that this is one half integral over k, scalar product of the gradient of phi in the direction theta minus one half integral over the boundary of k, the absolute value of the scalar product of the outer unit normal of k at y with the direction theta e of y dy. And, and that, that'll give it to you. Okay, I mean, I, I skipped some details, but this, these are the heuristics. So I think I, think I, I stopped uh, one minute early, but if anyone has questions, please, please ask. Yes, uh, are there any questions? And, uh... I, I, I wanted to ask just, uh, so this formula is uh, a generalization of uh, the one, uh, I don't know, in the 70s or the one you presented in the beginning for the volume? This one, yeah, exactly, exactly uh, generalization. But, th but that one did not have a boundary term, right? It had just an integral term. Is that true or is it it, 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 did, it didn't have this term. Um, so it had it has this term, but if I if you pick phi identically equal to one, the gradient dies, and uh -huh. this is just one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see, I see. Yeah. And and when you're applying it, are you applying it to some measures for which that part? It's it, exactly. So let me yeah. let me just draw a picture. Mm -hmm. So the the whole the whole proof of the Zhang inequality comes to the following picture. You have this k minus k, and you have a function which is concave on it. Right. I don't think we see the, we see the screen. I don't see the oh. screen, but maybe oh, it's I'm, me. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's my fault. I'm sorry about that. You you have the difference body of k, k minus k, and you have some function f which is concave on it, right? And yep. what you do is for Roger Shepard, you take the cone below the graph of the function on k minus k. For Zhang. You need to take these these supporting lines, these bigger ones, and that's where the the radial derivatives come into play. You use concavity and the fact that these guys are always above, and that's how you prove it. Yeah, yeah. But the, nice. but yeah, but the, the 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 real headache is getting the the appropriate convex body, right? Right. But uh, this is what does it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thanks. I wanted to ask uh, uh, this kind of a naive question. So, so I think there are some uh, uh, inequalities about lower dimensional volumes, right? Like mm -hmm. tubes or something. I, and uh, I'm not really a mm -hmm. geometer, so I don't know them so well. But mm -hmm. so you uh, define kind of a measure theoretic version, right? More uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, for n-dimensional volume. Uh, do you think you could uh, have kind of measure theoretic things for these lower dimensional things? Uh, or maybe it's already included. So, I, I don't know. Yeah, it's, yeah. so I, I can make ah, a it's comment. Included, yeah, so. yeah. Uh, automatically it's for free in, in some sense. So for example, uh, I'm sorry, let me find way back, not this one, but this one, for example, you get, 
this one. You get volume comparison of of, of central sections, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in and in fact, we didn't write it down, but you get the same thing here. the The key point is the fact. So instead of integrating over k, I can integrate over k intersect h, something like this, and I can get that. Uh, this average over k, I can take nu of h intersect k for free. One just has to write down the appropriate integral is always smaller than or equal to this new measure of this convex body intersected with the h. So you always get a sectional inequality of some kind. We didn't write it in the paper, but it's it's there. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. And in fact, I mean, there's there's a celebrated inequality that I even just want to write because it's 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 a beautiful one is if you take any convex body k, which contains zero, so zero is inside of k. And I take not even a hyperplane, but some h dimensional subspace, and I take its orthogonal complement h perp, I can project k onto here. I can project, or not k onto here, I can take this section of k by h, the central section of k by h, and I can project k onto h perp, and one can show, that the product of the volume of the section of k by h and say little k dimensions times the volume of the orthogonal projection of k onto h perp in n minus k dimension never exceeds n choose k, the volume of k in full dimension. This is called the uh, the projection section inequality. So here, here's one such, such example. Oh, okay, nice, nice. And in fact, this one implies Rogers Shepard. One can use it. You can go up into two n dimensions. You can pick the appropriate subspace, do the projection. Usually, you consider the diagonal space, and this will imply the difference body inequality. Uh, but to have something like this for Zhang would be extremely nice, I think. But I, I don't know how to do it. Thank you. Sure, no problem. Sorry. Are there any other questions? So Dima, I think that if you asked about the square mass integrals, the smaller uh, demand volume, well, quantities associated to a convex bodies, that's what I asked Mike last time I saw him mm -hmm. talk. And, and I think that in that case, there is still there are still some open questions about how to yeah. uh, how to bound the, the smaller mm -hmm. volumes vi's, let's say by mm -hmm. Um, yeah, by the yeah. So, for example, of... one can one can probably may, maybe I'll can I write it down for a second if you don't mind. Sure. But uh, one can define the ith core mass integral of your body k, right? It's just the integral. You, here's one such representation. You take some constant depending on n the dimension. You integrate over the Grassmannian. You take k projected onto h, and you integrate this with respect to the Haar measure on the Grassmannian. This is one way to understand the ith core mass integral of a convex body k. If you pick i equal to one at surface area, and one can maybe define, I don't know, f i of x to be the ith core mass integral of k intersected with x plus k, something like this. And you can maybe try to do the same thing, right? Uh, you have an integral representation. You can maybe try to take the first variation of this in a direction. On, on the appropriate dimensional sphere. You can maybe get this thing, which one might call a mixed projection body, and then try to do the same thing. I don't know if one's done it, if someone has done this, but uh, one could try something like this. Yeah, I didn't see it, no. So. Am I not sharing my screen? No, 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 I didn't see this around in the literature. Right? Ah, okay. <laughs> no, I see your screen, <laughs> yeah. Sure. It's funny yeah. because I don't usually think of the, the, the W is like this, I think more like the integrals over the polynomials in the, um, uh, the symmetric polynomials on the principal curvature. So, sure. you know, lowering sure. the degree. <laughs> sure. anyway. Yeah, but I mean, this one, this one allows you to consider the polytope. Yeah, exa right? exactly, exactly. This, uh, not, not only this, yeah, but it allows you to actually do this covariogram, which I'm not sure you could do with uh, just uh, like yeah. a boundary representation. Yes, and if you're worried about uh, dimensional dependence, you know, the ambient space, you can renormalize and take intrinsic volumes, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And try it this way. Okay. 
Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Sorry, we, we went over time. So the question. Yeah, sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs>